Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to see you on video. Soon we'll be seeing each other in person. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I promise that one day, Lord willing, we will. Uh, today, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 22, and we'll start with verse 1. It's going to be 24 verses, so it's a little bit long, but um, I read fast, so... We'll get started. Acts chapter 22, starting with verse 1. And remember, this is Paul giving his defense. We'll go into it later. Acts 22, 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous towards God as ye are all, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way, notice the words this way, meaning Christianity, unto the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, from whom I also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me it saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And why? And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the, thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing nearby and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast out their clothes and threw dust in the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your keeping power. We ask, Lord, that you'd have your way in our hearts today, that you'd open your word to our understanding, that you would prick our hearts to be more responsive to you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the work you're doing within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, so that was a very, that was the defense that Paul was giving to uh, the devout Jews of the temple who had uh, accosted him and were beating him, trying to kill him for allegedly teaching against the temple, against Moses, against God, against the Judaic tradition, uh, and supposedly brought a Gentile into the part of the temple where Gentiles were not allowed, thus polluting it. And this is his defense. So last week, well, last week we canceled because that migraine was not going to be denied. 
But the week before last, we talked about Paul, you know, how he was bound by two chains, not by Tupac, but by two chains. The scripture doesn't tell us if there's any pox involved, but, but if you want to play mind games, and Caleb's not here, but if you want to play mind games, you can try arguing that there's only one Tupac or one, two, three Pac. Like if there's only one surviving two can, we'd have to name it a one can and convince all future biologists. So yes, that headache probably leaves me with brain damage. Thank you for asking. Paul was bound with two chains and one chain to the soldier to the left and one chain to the soldier to the right. Soldier to the left of him, soldier to the right into the valley of death strode Paul. Um, and I spoke a little bit about the crowd's response to his defense, uh, which we had just seen here. And we'll probably address that uh, in the future, Lord willing. Uh, we talked about the idea that people, that the people who were bringing this accusation against Paul uh, may not have known they were lying. And the people who responded to those allegations and ran over and started beating on him to kill him uh, probably didn't know those were lies either. They were responding to allegations without having taken the time to stop him and find facts. Uh, it's such a huge blind spot in humanity uh, when you're angry with somebody or or a type of person <coughs> excuse me in fact when you're angry in general it's so easy to jump to wrong conclusions excuse me it's easy to jump to wrong conclusions and interpret everything that the other party does in the worst possible light with the worst possible motives and, and the the likelihood of us doing this uh, becomes greater the more we are convinced that we are the righteous party and that God is on our side. And I, if we would just let go of our pride and realize that God is no respecter of persons, and, and what that means is it's not just that he doesn't love the rich more than he loves the poor, he doesn't love the, the popular or the powerful more than, but it means that He's literally no respecter of the faith. It, it, he loves the person you despise every bit as much as he loves you. His love is not determined by your appreciation or lack thereof of another individual. He is love. And he actively exhibits the same amount of grace to you as he does to them. So when you can't believe that these people aren't being, you know, struck dead by lightning, uh, that same amount of grace that's preventing God from doing that to them is being used to prevent him uh, to, so that he doesn't do that to you as well. He exhibits the same amount of grace for you as he does for to them. And so when you complain that he's too gracious to others, understand that he's also very gracious to you. So if we get rid of that pride, and if we get rid of our anger and just look at God himself and his love, I think we'd be a little less inclined to rush to judgment. We'd be less inclined to assume the worst possible intent, and we might be a little more inclined to feel some compassion. I think it would be good if we would just take a moment and understand that if God showed up in the flesh right now, just there was Jesus showing himself in the flesh. And if he looked at us, he'd see the same thing he saw when he looked at that woman who was caught in the act of adultery. I mean, granted, I'm, I am a guy and two, I'm wearing clothes, but he sees past all that and sees the soul. And what he would see is the same thing he saw with that woman caught in the very act of adultery. He would see the very same thing he saw when he looked at Judas, even after saying, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. He looks at us with a love beyond our comprehension. But the more we strive to comprehend, the more likely we are to start to demonstrate a little bit of that love to others. It's amazing how I hear two different sides to each story. 
both parties invariably act with absolute purity of heart and long-suffering forbearance against the vicious outrages committed against them by the blackest hearted villains, the, the worst scoundrels, probably Satan worshipers to ever walk the earth. And both of them have that same viewpoint. And I think it's a wise warning uh, that the more sure you are that you are the good guy, the less likely it is that you are the good guy. Everywhere Paul and everywhere Jesus went, people who were overwhelmingly confident in their righteousness opposed them violently, vehemently, with utter assurance that their hatred was God appointed. But God is not hatred. God is love. And there will be a time when we see the wrath of God, when we see uh, the fierceness, when we see the judgment, uh, when God will no longer shield his holiness against the unholy and heaven and earth will melt away as corruption and mortality cannot exist in the presence of incorruption and eternality. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. That was Romans eleven twenty two. Emphasis was mine. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, they beheld the severity. But to you, if you continue in his goodness, you'll behold his goodness. If not, if you do not continue in his goodness, you also will be cut off. Yes. You see how it, it depends on your actions, how it depends on your activity to keep yourself uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep yourself uh, acting as he would have you to act, doing what's necessary, keeping yourself abiding in the vine. Uh, if you fall, if you abandon, if you jump away, then you encounter the severity. So whose severity? God's, not yours. Your job is to love God and to love every individual. There was a popular saying in my, in my earlier years, kill them all and let God sort them out. Well, the Lord would say, love them all and let God sort them out. Uh, it's not up to us to decide who we should treat with love. He says, love thy neighbor as thyself and then unfortunately he goes on to indicate that everybody who needs help is your neighbor and the sad reality is that everybody needs help we look at how stephen uh, responded to his accusers the lord lay not this sin to their charge and, and what did the lord say he said forgive them for they know not what they do. This is what the Lord himself said as he was being crucified. And think about, think about that for a second. The Lord is being crucified. He's, he's nailed to a cross, not just bound to a cross, but nailed to a cross. At the instigation and through the manipulations of the uh, Jewish religious establishment, this was not something that was off the cuff and done in a fit of anger. Stephen, yeah, there was some anger involved in that, a reaction to his daring to testify of their own sins. And, and Paul here being beaten uh, in an attempt to beat him to death, uh, that was a response of, of some manipulation, but then just a crowd angry at the defiling of their temple, thinking they're acting in accordance with God's will, right? But Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, being crucified was it was done through the direct manipulation by the religious establishment, by their four cunning, as uh, we read elsewhere uh, from that time on, they, they, they started plotting out ways to kill him. And yes, I know the Romans are the ones who nailed him to the cross and, and crucified him, but they were just the instrument which the Jewish leaders used. Everyone involved in that crucifixion was incredibly aware of what they were doing. They were crucifying Jesus of Nazareth. Some Jews thought he might actually be the Messiah, but were complicit in his death because he threatened their seat of power, because he threatened their uh, 
their status quo. But the Lord said, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this sounds like he's saying, oh, these people are acting out of ignorance, so they aren't really to blame. But that's not what he says. He doesn't say anything about blame. In fact, the princes of this world, that is the demonic powers of this world, truly did not know what they were doing in crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. They really didn't know. Oh, they knew they were crucifying Jesus of Nazareth, the, the son of God, uh, God's anointed one, the one who had the right to torment them before their time of torment. They knew that he could send them to the pit before God's appointed time of, of judgment and sending them to the pit. And, and who, who can uh, preempt God in his judgment? Only God himself. But Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about the wisdom of God in a mystery. And he says in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The demons didn't know what they were doing, even though they knew so much about the Lord Jesus Christ. But they didn't know that the Holy One of God was the Holy One, God himself. If they had known that, they wouldn't have crucified him. But there was no forgiveness for the princes of this world who acted in ignorance and evil. But there is forgiveness for the humans who also acted also in ignorance and also in evil. We all are ignorant. For if we ever saw ourselves as we truly are before the Lord, we would be destroyed with despair and, and self-disgust. And we are all ignorant because if we saw ourselves as the Lord chooses to see us, we would be destroyed by our, by our own pride and arrogance in the light of his inexpressible, long-suffering, patient, forgiving love. The true encounter with the rock of ages, the stone rejected by the builders yet become the chief cornerstone of God's habitation with humanity. When you encounter the rock, you will either fall upon it and be broken, or it will fall upon you and you will be ground to dust. Fall upon the rock of the revelation. Cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and let your vision and knowledge of him break you from your conceit. And don't think I mean conceit as in pride. It is pride. Conceit uh, it entails pride, but it also entails every and any false conception. Fall upon him and let his truth break your despair and your fear with his love. Let it break your conception of your righteousness and even your rightness and let him fill you with the compassion that can only come from him. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Oh, this is so contrary to how we instinctively act. It's contrary to how we intentionally act, even when we know we should, because it runs counter to our own desire. It runs so contrary to our own instincts, but God says you need to be broken. That part of you needs to break so that I can plant within you my, my love and my compassion. I've got to take those, those glasses of, of ignorance and evil off of your face so that you can see people the way or through the lenses I give you, through the lens of my love and my compassion. Fall on him and allow him to break you. When you get a true glimpse of the Almighty God in Christ Jesus, you will want to sin no more. Oh, you're, you're still going to sin, and you're still going to sin because you want to, but you will find a growing desire to not be who and what you used to be. You will no longer want to be the sinful person that you are, and you'll find this growing desire to be what he wants you to be. And then that's when you need to cling to him so that it moves past just this, oh, it would be nice if I didn't have this, this thing 
attached to me to where you start to hate that sin that binds you. And so you cast it off uh, at his feet and allow him to bring you into victory and newness of life. We, we read of, of, these, of these men of God and the persecutions they faced, and we never see anger, and we never see indignation. We, we don't see self-righteous calls for judgment, but we see them faithfully proclaiming the one true living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not in judgment, not in Jesus is going to get you, not in all... Oh, I serve the Almighty, and he's going to get you for this, not, not in judgment, not in condemnation, but demonstrating in word and in deed the gospel, the, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that even those who despitefully use them, even those who are doing their best to kill them, and remember that they're, they're beating Paul to death when this centurion, or when this chief captain comes upon and, and saves him. And these people are trying are doing their very best to kill him, and, but he give he gives them this defense, this this explanation, this testimony of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Why not to condemn them, but so that they would have a chance to hear and a chance to repent of their sins and to share in that same good news of a loving Savior who wants them to share with you in life everlasting. You see the compassion and the love that flows through. They're not defending themselves as we would think defending against charges. He's not saying, I never said anything against the law. He doesn't say, I never brought a Gentile into the court, but he gives them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it a defense? It is. Because if you saw the Lord Jesus Christ, all these things that make you mad enough to kill somebody, are going to just be little irritations that you can overcome through his grace. When you see the Lord Jesus Christ, when you get blinded by his glory, all those things that, that you currently allow yourself to flip out over, those things that consume your thoughts and, and strike to your deepest core, those things stop being as important to you because you understand, at least in your own life, how deeply the Lord loves you and how patient he is with you and how long suffering he is with your attitude and your and your stubbornness and how he gave himself to so that you could be with him forever. Paul saw the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He fell upon that rock and was broken and reformed. He went from zealously using the law and the sword to destroy his opponents to using the sword of scripture to show truth and the law of truth to demonstrate God's mercy and love. Uh, I, yeah, we're, we're not talking about, we're not getting into the narrative here, but I urge you fall upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your vision of him break you and reshape you into his image. That's what I want you to get tonight. We, we didn't get into the narrative, and, and we're not going to, we didn't get a chance to really go into, into the in-depth parsing of his words. But we took a look at his spirit as he being rescued from being beaten almost to death, certainly with the intent to, to die, to kill him. We see that he turns around and gives this testimony of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I used to beat people. I used to persecute people who, who uh, acted contrary to my understanding of the law, just like you are doing now. In fact, I was so zealous with it. I had these very elders who are inciting you to violence. I had letters from them to go uh, to Damascus and other places to go put, uh, put those Christians to the sword. But while I was engaged in the very same activities you are today, God himself revealed himself to me in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he changed me. He broke me. And he can do the same for you. Do you see how that message, it's, no, it's not a defense. It's not a, a defense of his actions anyway. But it is that statement to those people who are caught up in that zealous uh, desire to, to do right by God, if it means killing somebody. It's getting through to those very people. I was just like that. 
but there is salvation from the death that this path brings. And he tells them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Not clinging to your prerogatives, not using your own abilities to do what you want, but humbling yourself and loving others as you would want them to love you and treating others as you would want to be treated and, and acting as you wish others would act. Allow the love of Christ to fill you and allow his compassion to overflow you and his grace to prove its sufficiency in all things. I hope you see past the words uh, and the, the length of the scripture to see the heart of the man who had just been beaten with the intent of being beaten to death, who was facing a bloodthirsty mob who wanted nothing more than to see him dead. And what does he do? He tells them about the loving God who saved him and who gave himself to save them. We can learn a lot from Paul. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're sorry that we're not more like you, and that we often do such a poor job of reflecting you and the goodness that you show us. Help us to see you more clearly, to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for being so gentle, so loving and patient with us. I ask, Lord, that you would use this opportunity and that you would help us all to give you this opportunity to, to help us voluntarily fall upon you that we might be broken and reformed into what you want us to be. We ask, Lord, that your love would shine through us, that the joy you provide would be real and apparent within us. We love you, and we thank you. In your name, which is above every name we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.